So I am going to introduce our next speaker tonight, or this afternoon, and it's someone that I have known for a few years who has dedicated himself to a number of areas. Uh, an area that I hold dear and I'm very passionate about and committed to is one concerning extraterrestrial life and contact, which is something that uh, initially was what introduced me to Sterling Allen. Uh, but what has uh, happened over the last several years that I've noticed is that he has developed a real passion, a real drive for new energy. Now, I don't know if that came out of his interest or, or some say obsession with extraterrestrial life. I mean, that's what happens to many of us. We kind of get obsessed with it and can't do other things and do crazy things like leave cushy professor, professorships at different universities to do this work where you know, people think you're some sort of coot because you believe that there's intelligent life out there. So anyway, I mean, it becomes an obsession, obsession for some of us. And at some point in that journey, you begin to contemplate, well, if they're coming from a long way out there, other parts of the galaxy, universe, well, how are they getting here? I mean, it must be a big tank loads of oil, right? Um, no, it doesn't quite work that way. So you, you become open to the possibility that they've developed new energy systems. So I don't know if, if, if this is something that opens Sterling up to this phenomenon, but I do know that over the last several years, he has become very passionate and very committed to the new energy field and has developed a number of websites, a number of initiatives uh, concerning new energy, promoting the feasibility of them, uh, helping new energy inventors and researchers and investigators come together. He's formed the New Energy Congress, uh, new, new Energy News Services, a Wikipedia on new energy. He's really kind of done so much to help bring the new energy field to the attention of many people who are open to the idea that there is something out there that is far beyond coal, oil and gas, far beyond solar, wind, thermal, something far beyond all of these things. And they go by a number of names, but I'm not going to talk about that because I think that's really something that Sterling Allen is most uh, equipped to be able to talk about. Uh, he is going to really do us uh, a great service because he's going to do the hard work of ranking the 10 most, ex most interesting, feasible, exotic new energy systems, which is, which is great for many of us who are still trying to kind of wrap our minds about what's out there, what's real, what's feasible, and what, what might be worth um, putting our resources into. So with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Sterling Allen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everyone, aloha. I'm a Hawaii virgin. This is my first time, and uh, my wife is here with me. It's the uh, first time that she's been able to come to one of these presentations. So this is a, a twice uh, first time for me. I really appreciate being able to be here at a very uh, interesting audience. I've been looking uh, forward to this and uh, put quite a bit of time into preparing this, even though I don't have time to put the time into it. It's a really uh, crazy time for me right now. With uh, I'm actually building a renewable home myself, uh, not just solar wind, geothermal tide, but uh, earth bag technology. I'm actually going to go look at an earth bag home while I'm here on the island. The guy that got me interested in building an earth bag home is here in Kona. And uh, he's going to show me a home that he built uh, on Sunday. He didn't build it on Sunday. On <laughs> and uh, so this, this is a very uh, you know, interesting time for us. Um, but I, I hope that in giving this presentation, you'll have an appreciation for just how exciting this field of new energy is. And at a bare minimum, I hope you'll subscribe to our free newsletter. It comes in your email uh, pretty much every day. We, we do put news on our, our website every day. Even when I'm at conventions like this, I find time to squeeze something in, something that really cool that came in through an email or whatever, or something I prepared beforehand. Um, but in the world of free energy technology, there are some really exciting things happening uh, almost every day. There's just something that's just blow your mind. Um, now, let's see here if this is going to work for us. Oh, there we go. 
Uh, you can get this presentation online, so those of you who tend to like to take notes, uh, you can ease off just a little bit. Of course, this isn't the kind of audience that takes rigorous notes. You kind of just are there and uh, soak it in. That's great. Uh, but I do have the PowerPoint presentation. I'll put it up online um, so you can download it. Um, this is a little saying that we have at the beginning of each of the little radio shows and, and whenever we do a presentation. And it's actually my mo mother-in-law's voice that you'll hear that says, imagine a world in which every home has its own power generator that obtains its energy in such a way that no fuel has to be added. Imagine every vehicle being able to run without ever stopping for fuel. Imagine each appliance having its own power source that never has to be recharged. That is the world of the future. Join with us as we track our progress towards such a world. Uh, here's a little outline of what we'll be talking about. We'll just uh, define what is free energy. Uh, the basis for determining this top 10 exotic free energy listing. Some runners up, or uh, then we'll get to the top 10, and then we'll talk about some runners up, and uh, that's kind of the buffer. If we have uh, some extra time, we'll, we'll fit in as many as we can. Then we'll talk a little bit about open sourcing, which I think is going to be the way to introduce these breakthrough technologies that really have a hard time breaking into the marketplace through the traditional routes because they get blocked up in the, whether it's in the patent process or getting a business team together or there's so many hoops you have to jump through to go from concept and prototype to the marketplace. And open source, I think, is a way to break the log jam. And so we'll talk about that for a minute. Uh, when we, th we live in very difficult times, uh, economically and otherwise, and if we get too upset, we can always compare ourselves to the guys that live in these galaxies, where you've got an incoming planet, incoming star, uh, two galaxies crashing together. Things could be worse than what we have here on planet Earth. So. Um, in talking about an ideal energy supply, um, what is, the, uh, if, if you can conceive, just what would be the perfect device? Um, it needs to be affordable, um, really affordable would be nice. Uh, renewable, non-depleting, you're not depleting the Earth's resources. It's something that's constantly rejuvenated. Environmentally friendly, you're not destroying anything, uh, leaving a zero footprint. Continuous output, you know, solar is nice, but you know, when the sun goes down, there goes the solar, you have to have a battery backup, and sometimes you have extended days of no sun. And in Hawaii, actually, we get more uh, full sun days in Utah than you do here in Hawaii. Uh, it's a lot cooler up there, but uh, in, in fact, I did a little joke in my email to my family, because we're getting really cold temperatures in the mainland right now, and I was just kind of rubbing it in a little bit, we're going to Hawaii, and I, I went to weather.com, and the weather forecast for 10 days in Kona was 80, 81, 81, 81, 82, 81, 81, 81, 81. It was like, how boring can you get? <laughs> I'm saying that facetiously, of course. It's really nice. But um, you know, compared to the weather we're getting up there, where it's all over the charts. Um, but continuous output, some of these devices that we'll be showing you do have that attribute. In fact, most of them do. Um, it, they don't come and go with, you know, the wind comes and goes, but these are constant output. They just go and go and go and go. Load following. So, you know, if you've got a gener generator that's constantly putting out five kilowatts at night, you don't need that. But in the, the day when you're running a washer and dryer and, you know, you've got all these things going, your peak load, you want to have that full load. The ideal device would actually ramp up and ramp down exactly as you need that power. So that's what load following means. Um, robust, you're not going to have to go out and fix the, the um, bearings and, you know, something goes wrong with it. So something that's going to be really um, going to last, that would be nice too. Scalable, you can make it tiny, you can make it huge. That's a nice attribute as well. Uh, portable, put it in your wireless, you can put it in your car. Uh, that's a nice attribute. In fact, a lot of these um, free energy devices of the exotic sort are portable. Um, and by the way, my little key, I'm going to be, you'll see this slide quite a few times as we go through the top 10 after each of the um, items. We'll show this slide and we'll put in bold um, the attribute which that particular 
um, device has as a strength. And in italics, uh, that means it's kind of a weak point. We'll get down there in a second on this one. Materials are sustainable. Um, sometimes uh, the things that go into the component, for example, a solar panel, even though that's free energy, you're harnessing the sun's energy, uh, sometimes the footprint required to make the silicon and to, uh, you know, the whole process is actually quite um, non-sustainable to a certain extent. You have to weigh that in. Um, practical, you know, you, you can make energy, you can, you can hook a wire up to a tree and get a couple of watts of electricity. You might be able to charge your, uh, a, a pocket calculator with that, but you can't carry it around with you. So that's not a practical energy device. You can get energy from rocks, um, potatoes. Uh, you can make little batteries out of potatoes, but it's not practical because, you know, for, for the, the, the free energy device needs to be something that's going to be useful. And then the reason I put I, this uh, strong team in italics at the bottom as a weak point for free energy devices, and this is actually the appeal, the appeal that I want to make to this particular audience. Very often, <clears throat> in fact, I think my next slide, no, not yet. Um, very often in the free energy world, people tend to get really exotic. Um, you think outside the box. You, you tend to be somewhat of a loner. You know, as a kid, you really didn't fit in, so you don't develop the social skills, and you tend to not really fit in. And so um, <clears throat> these inventors not only think outside the box, but they act outside the box. And it's, it's hard to get a business relationship with these guys. You know, if you don't look at them the exact right way, that, you know, they get the wrong impression, and then they're getting upset with you, and then they want to go talk to the next person. And it can really be really difficult. They become their own worst enemies. In fact, we could have one a presentation sometime might be uh, the top 10 most uh, own worst enemy uh, inventors who have shot themselves in their own foot. Um, and, and that actually would be the case with many of the technologies you hear about. That's why they don't make it to market, not because the men in black show up and, and threaten them with a bazooka, but because they, they can't get along with the people that want to help them. That's, that's a very, I find that that is the primary obstacle to bringing new technologies forward. And that's why an audience like this that has, that, that is already outside the box in other areas, uh, and maybe some of you have some extra money to throw around, you have the understanding that you know how to relate to these people because you're outside the box too. Most people with lots of money are not really outside the box, and so they don't understand the language and the mentality and the thinking of these guys who just want to help the planet. They don't want to, or some of them want to, well, anyway. Um, the idea is that strong team is a weak point on exotic technologies, and that is one of the reasons why we haven't, after hundreds of years of some of these things being around, the Tesla technologies, that's why we don't see them in the marketplace yet. It's not because they're not viable but because of that, that last point. And I think we're at a time when we're going to overcome that obstacle. We're going to start seeing these technologies finally make it. And the technologies we'll be um, featuring today are some which, you know, many of them we could see this year. Some of them are already um, out there, are available. You can actually uh, buy the plans online and put one in your car, for example. And so, um, these are things which are really, they're, they're real, they're here, they're now, they're going to be coming in the next year, two, three years. <clears throat> when people say something's impossible, that's when I start getting interested. Uh, the higher the eyebrows go on the, the college physics professor's eyes, the more I think, oh, this is, you know, if there's a working prototype and, and it violates the laws of physics, that's when we get really excited, um, you know, in our news service, free energy news. Yeah, we cover solar, wind, geothermal tide, the, the typical stuff, but we try and focus in on those exotic things that are really pushing the envelope. Um, it's not perpetual motion. You'll find inventors that think they've invented a perpetual motion machine. If it's working, the energy is coming from somewhere. It's harnessing, whether it's coming from zero point energy, whether it's the Earth's magnetic field, whether it's the flux between the Earth is going around the sun and the Earth and the moon are magnetic bodies. You've got massive flux there. We understand tides. Tides come and go because the, the moon is a gravitational body. It makes the Earth slosh around as it, as it goes around 
Uh, as the Earth spins once each day, it, it sees the moon and the, the oceans follow the moon. We understand that. Why can't we have a little more imagination and realize these are electromagnetic bodies also? They're not just gravitational. And so you're going to be creating magnetic fluxes. And when have you heard a college professor talking about that? And yet, that could be a potential energy source. And so when we see energy seeming to come from nowhere, doesn't mean it's not coming from somewhere. Um, an aborigine seeing a radio would think that's magic, that you're you know, getting these voices coming out of this box. But you and I understand the physics of how that works. It's really not mis mysterious to us. And so these, when you see perpetual motion, um, you know, the idea of somebody lifting themselves up with their own bootstraps, that's not what's going on here. We're talking about devices that are harnessing energy freely from the environment, whether it's sun, geothermal, et cetera, or whether it's electromagnetic over unity, some kind of Tesla principle that is pulling into some field out there. Um, we have this statement on the bottom of our sites, uh, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. Um, what is yesterday's heresy is today's dogma. Or, and, and this is one of my favorites. When, when you're one step ahead of the crowd, you're a genius. When you're two steps ahead, you're a crackpot. <laughs> and I, I can relate to that, because that's, that's been my specialty all my adult life, is crackpot. Um, really looking for those things, the new ways of doing things. There, uh, you know, one of my earlier websites, uh, um, you know, the idea of greater things. There's always a, a better way to do things. Um, and, and that's one of the things, that's why these technologies don't get the funding and support that they need is because they're looked at as crackpot. But the problem is there's a lot of things that they're, they're associated with that are you know, really out there are bogus or are fraudulent. And so there's a lot of noise out there in the midst of that signal. Um, here's my little axiom. Generally speaking, one's eccentricity is directly proportional to the distance one is outside the box. Um, and, and Mavericks, because we talked about that earlier, they're outside the mainstream, they don't get the social skills that other people get. Um, you have Interpersonal conflicts are the greatest impediment to progress of exotic technologies. Um, and this phenomenon is not just true. You can relate to this. It's not just true of energy. It's true of, of alternative health. It's true of alternative psychology, of homeschooling. You know, whenever you get outside the box, you'll find that you start associating and gravitating toward other things. And this phenomenon holds true in all of those. So again, uh, here's our list that we're going to be um, looking at the ideal technology. Um, we live in an exciting time. The cost of energy, uh, is go of fossil fuels is going up. Of course, recently we had this little dip. Um, but meanwhile, what we're seeing is in renewables, the cost is going down. And we live in a time when these two curves are going to be intersecting. Even now, uh, Utility scale solar and wind technologies are on a par with fossil fuel natural gas um, prices. There's a plant that's going to be going in uh, online this year or next in California, a solar farm. It's going to be, I think, um, 2.75 gigawatts, which is the same output as Hoover Dam at a price cheaper than Hoover Dam or fossil fuels or natural gas, and this is a solar technology. These huge wind farms that you see are generating electricity at a price comparable to what you can get from other um, sources. And so these curves are starting to intersect. The technologies we'll be talking about today, though, could be one-tenth the cost of what you're paying for electricity right now. Once they're finally um, perfected and they're, uh, you know, they've got the bugs worked out, you can get economies of scale going, uh, you can make one of these things, uh, and it, you can make energy completely affordable for everyone on the planet. And you get rid of the grid and the control um, that, that these guys who are racking our planet with problems are able to control us with the ability to control power and our purse strings and whatnot. Just think, if you don't have to stop for fuel, 
when you're driving your car. If you don't have to pay the, the electricity for your house, you don't have to worry about your house getting too cold because you've got this really cheap energy generator in your garage. The entire spectrum of societal infrastructure and, and the way we deal with one another will be changed. We will move from a scarcity mentality where we have to fight and compete over everything to an abundance mentality where, where we can start thinking about what are our natural God-given talents that, and we can develop those talents. We don't have to worry about eking out a living and being slaves to some New World Order oligarchy. That's where we're heading with and free energy will be one of the drivers that will introduce on a technological basis um, both the, the technology capability to live in that world and it will help foster the, the, the um, enlightened thinking of independence and individual responsibility and not depending on a central authority. So when we say free energy, um, we've talked about solar wind, geothermal tide, those are free energy sources. You don't have to pay for the sun, you don't have to pay for the wind. And so we like to call those free energy um, along with the other, the more exotic ones, the cold fusion, the magnet motors, over unity electromagnetic systems, um, water power, some of the more exotic ones, um, where, you, where you actually water itself in the conversion of water to fuels, you're getting some over unity principles where you put in X amount of energy and you're getting two, three, ten times as much energy out as what you put in because it's harnessing something in the environment somehow. Um, here's a longer list of energy technologies. On the left-hand side, the conventional technologies that you hear about, and on the right-hand side, some of the more exotic ones. And we'll go into some of these uh, in detail um, in talking about, uh, and I should tell you in my selection of the top 10, I, I use a little bit of bias in trying to get a cross-section of di different kinds of exotic technologies. Um, So what are the determining factors of, of why I selected the 10 that I did? Um, I, I've been in the field of renewable energy, as, as uh, Michael was saying, in a focused manner for about almost eight years now. Coming in May, I think, is, is my anniversary. It will be eight years that I've been totally immersed. When I say immersed, I'm not talking full-time job. I'm talking about eating, breathing, the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed, ask my wife. Um, you know, this, this is something I'm very passionate about. And so uh, before that, I was um, as passionate about, you know, looking at codes in, in uh, word studies and looking at uh, geopolitical things and studying conspiracies and, you know, the 911 thing. You know, I, you know I, I, I've been a maverick all my life, and so I would present to you that as a credential of why I'm qualified to look outside the box, because I've been outside the box all my life. Uh, and, and even as a kid, my, my dad had a solar uh, stuff going with my, uh, on at home. My mom was making fruit leather when I was a kid, drying fruit out in the car where it's nice and warm. Um, I mean, she, she, you can buy the stuff she used to make for us as a kid, and, and I'm 47 years old, so you know, she was way 46. Don't want, to, don't, don't want to get myself older sooner than I need to. Um, anyway, so I'm a maverick. Uh, free, energy, free Energy News and Directory Service. Uh, if you go to freeenergynews.com, that's a website that I've had up for a long time. Uh, covering the field of free energy uh, on a daily basis, people are sending me really great stories. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm digesting this stuff, looking at it, calling it through, trying to find the best things and featuring those things in our news. On, on any given day, I would say that uh, you know, if, if I'm putting four stories in the news, I, sl I, I skip over 10 that I could have posted, and I had to just kind of make a judgment, a you know, triage, so to speak, of you know, what am I going to spend my time making a news bullet on. And so that process helps kind of uh, get, get the gears going, the juices going. I, I'm the free energy newsman on the planet, basically. You know, when, when people think about you know, we have a, a kudos page on our website of, you know, what what's, uh, people have said about our service, and people are calling our news and directory service the best um, bar none. There's, there's some other services that are really good, um, you know, some focus in this area, some focus in that area, but in terms of covering all things exotic free energy, we're it, okay? So that's another thing to present to you is, you know, why, where I'm coming from in presenting these top ten, um, 
the New Energy Congress I founded four years ago um, in November, um, because as I was looking at all these technologies, it, it gets overwhelming because there's so many bogus things out there, and there's, you, know, you get tricked up, you know, tripped up by things. Um, and, and I wanted to have a body of people that I could pass these things by, say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, and, and somebody could say, hey, well, I went and looked at that one. We tested it, and here's what our results were. So we founded this body. Uh, it's an international body of people who, um, like myself, have a passion about free energy technologies. And uh, I can pass things by them. And we, we've come up with a top 100 clean energy technologies listing. Uh, Top100energy.com is a shortcut to that. Um, and the, um, in that process, you know, we, we look at conventional as well as non-conventional. It's an even playing field. And so most of the stuff that's in that listing, because one of our criteria is, is credibility and uh, how, far along develop, or how, how far along it is in its development, and, and because of the, the credibility factor and the, and the verification factor is very evasive on these more exotic technologies, um, they don't make it into the top 10. Most of, them, most of the top 10 technologies, exotic technologies that we'll be talking about today, are not in the top 100 listing that we made as a New Energy Congress. Um, and so this is kind of a, this is an outside the box from the clean energy world uh, type of listing. Um, another criteria for establishing ideal energy devices, um, we'll get onto that in a second of, of you know, how do we decide what is going to make it into the top 100. Um, I have, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm building my own home and integrating uh, some of these uh, new principles. And so I'm very personally invested. I, I'm going to have an off-grid home. I've got a wife and four kids to support that I can't have freezing in the winter and, and getting too hot in the summer. And we've got to be able to survive in this thing. You know, if, if we have a societal meltdown, which is a possible um, possibility for the United States in the foreseeable future, that we could have real meltdown. You know, we want to survive. We want to make it through. And so I'm very personally invested in having a system that's going to work in our home, and we're building it right now. So I think that's another credential I would present to you as, as why you might want to pay attention to this list of top 10. Um, and then I should mention just in terms of a, uh, on a negative aspect, um, I am personally invested or directly um, involved in many of these top 10 technologies we'll be talking about. So there's some personal bias involved. I like the guys. I've received donations from some of them. In fact, my wife is here because um, one of these guys that uh, we'll be listing as a sponsor um, paid for her trip um, as a sponsor, Green Power Inc. Um, it's a waste to diesel technology. It'll take municipal waste on the input side, and on the output side, you get high-grade diesel, better fuel than what you can get from fossil fuels um, that burns cleaner. Pretty good technology, and that was a sponsor for um, my wife getting here today. Um, here's just a little blurb on our uh, intentional community that we're doing. Uh, we're building our own home. That's the kind of uh, artist conception I drew that. Um, we had a guy from a French television station come and do an airing at our house the other day, and I, I whipped that out. Um, it's kind of a half kidney or kidney bean shape. Um, it's going to have a kind of a concrete roof. Uh, earth bag walls on the front and back, solarium along the front on the south exposure. The back side is going to be backfilled, so we use the earth's temperature, the constant temperature of the earth, so we're not heating and cooling against the outside temperature. We're heating and cooling against 55 degrees in, in the floor and on the back wall. We'll insulate against that, but we're insulating against 55 as opposed to 106 on, in, in the summer and uh, negative 20 in the winter. Um, and We'll use compost toilets, um, so we're not going to have any black water. We're recycling all our water. We're going to do rainwater capture, um, have cisterns to collect the water in. Uh, we're going to have solar panels. Part of that is to uh, make the county happy. They're going to want to see something conventional. My, meanwhile, we're going to have a shed in the back where one of these, one of these people in the top, one, or top 10 is uh, planning on giving us one of the technologies to power our house with. Okay? So the solar panels uh, is uh, window dressing. Um, to, to just fake them out, you know? Um, and, and I can't tell you which one. I wish I could. Uh, that, will, that announcement will be made in the future. Um, 
we do have a community of people who are wanting to build houses like this. Safehavenvillages.org is a shortcut that will take you to our wiki website, PezWiki. Um, okay, we've talked about the New Energy Congress. Um, here are the criteria that we use in the top 100. It's a little different than the criteria I'm using for these top 10 exotics. Um, we've gone through some of these, oops, excuse me. Um, the environmental impact, affordable, credible. Credible is one of, that I'm not using as heavily in this top 10 exotic listing because credible and exotic usually don't go together. Um, and implementation, uh, politics of science, that's, that's this whole idea of inventors that can't get along with uh, the, the business people and the legal, et cetera. That's something that we weigh heavily, and that's why a lot of these top 10 exotic technologies don't make it into the top 100, because it's too hard to work with. What they really need is people like you who can talk their language, who can relate to them, who have some resources or who, who have friends with some resources you can bring in to bear, whether it's business expertise, able to write a business plan, able to make a business out of this thing, able to bring in the proper legal, uh, you know, aspects that you need, um, help, help them along because you can relate to them, help, help befriend them and help, you know, help break the log jam on whatever it is that's tripping them up. Um, okay, just really quick, here's the top 10 of the top 100. There's not the top 10 exotics that we're going to be talking about today. In fact, none of these, I don't think any of these top 10 from our top 100 listing um, are making it into the top 10 exotics. Uh, there's the Sterling Energy System, which is a, a big um, parabolic dish that focuses the sun onto a, a Sterling engine, which is an external combustion engine system, um, super efficient. This is one I was telling you about that would be, I can't remember if it was one or 2.75 gigawatt, same as the output of the Hoover Dam, that's them. Um, Cyclone. This is uh, the solar, here's, here's a geothermal one. Uh, this one's pretty cool. This one's somewhat exotic, but um, you know, it, it's not so exotic that the mainstream press isn't going to be covering it. Um, so a battery technology, solar, focus fusion. This one's pretty exotic. Um, th this is a really cool technology. I think they're number 11 or 12 on my short list. So they're not going to be in our top 10, but they're really close. Environmission Solar, they're going to be in our news tomorrow. They actually just announced a plant in uh, Arizona. Um, a, a, one of these big, huge, tall towers with a skirt that is uh, like a, a greenhouse, heats up the air, air goes up the tower, chimney effect, turns a turbine, generates electricity. They're making, I think, a 750 megawatt system with two, uh, actually that's 750 million dollars to build a, a 200 megawatt output system. Those two towers in, in Hawaii. Now let's get to the exotic top 10. Um, number one. Um, I put this as number one. Uh, this is a, a device that has demonstrated several kilowatt output with just uh, dissimilar metals um, put in plates. Um, this is a proprietary patented process. In fact, when this guy went to get a patent in the United States several years ago, they slapped an, a national security order on it that he was basically to cease and desist because it had national security implications. He went to Panama and continued working, started working with the Japanese. They made 20,000 of these, and the Japanese government confiscated it for some kind of, secure, or some kind of uh, safety consideration. But he's still at it. And uh, here are some of the prototypes that they've made. Um, there's a video on our website, uh, our Pez Wiki website, that you can see from YouTube, where they'll take a, a bulb, a Christmas uh, a light, and run it up these two little rods. And you see the Christmas light, light just as it's touching those two little rods. And there's nothing else attached to this thing. There's no batteries or anything. Um, and these guys, I would guess, will be ready to go commercial within a couple of years. So you'll be able to buy one of these things um, and, and install it. They're just working out. They have some really interesting effects. Um, they can't have rebar underneath 
the foundation because uh, it starts sparking and melting. Um, it's harnessing the Earth's magnetic field somehow. Um, and it ha it's affected by ley lines. It works better in some areas than in other areas. And it works better close to the equator than further away from the equator. Um, <clears throat> this one would be very affordable, renewable. Um, I'm saying, uh, I'm not putting a bolt on environmental friendly because um, maybe some of the materials in the process of mining those materials might rake the earth a little bit. Um, continuous output, load following, whatever you need, it will give it to you. Um, robust, low maintenance, scalable, up and down, no problem. Uh, portable, uh, um, it might be problematic because it follows ley lines, and so you might have imp or higher or lower capability. You're driving down the road, it might interfere. You have to keep them like 30 feet apart from each other, and if you're passing by a car, all of a sudden you lose power. That's not going to work very well. So um, it doesn't get a bold on portable. Um, strong team, they've got a really good team. Um, they've actually got some really good investors. You've heard about these guys most likely, Storn. In fact, I meant to look at their website. They actually started their second demonstration today over in Ireland um, where they have an electromagnetic system that uh, allegedly takes, puts more energy out than what they put into it. Um, and they actually started with a magnet motor technology. They were supposed to do a demonstration back in 2007. July 4th is when they launched that demonstration. Big to do. They did a, did a big press release. Uh, and then the thing didn't work. Uh, it was a real embarrassment for them. So they came up with a second um, similar whiz-bang thing last uh, December 15th. They had another big um, demonstration over in Dublin, Ireland. Um, they had this battery-powered electromagnetic version that was supposed to, the same battery that's making things spin is being recharged by that system and is supposed to basically not be diminishing in power. It wasn't a very convincing demonstration, and today they, they were um, announced their second one, and I, I kicked myself because I was going to be right on top of that and, and watch that demonstration. It was, um, let me see, what time is, yeah, that was about uh, six hours ago that they launched that again. You want to go check that out. We'll have that in our news in the coming days. Um, here's a little bit on their history. Um, in 2003, um, their, their company actually um, comes up with systems to work on security systems for houses and businesses. And they were coming up with a more efficient microgenerator for their system. And they a, started finding a really unusual effect. And in August of 2006, they put a full page ad in The Economist, which took the world by storm. There was all kind of press coverage on their, their announcement, because they're, they're a pretty credible company. You know, this isn't some small potatoes inventor who, who can't brush his teeth and floss, you know, he, and, and he doesn't dress right, and, and everyone just, you know, you look at them and you ignore them. This, this is a very credible company making this kind of announcement. He obviously has some money, put this full page ad in The Economist, so, you know, people paid attention. And that got a, a lot of buzz going, and they were basically saying, look, we found this effect that, that we don't understand, and we invite the, the world to submit some uh, engineers to us, and we'll come up with an independent jury and uh, have you test this thing. Um, this, this will be an independent jury of people who will weigh the technology, replicate it, and then come up with a verdict. Unfortunately, the verdict that they came up with in uh, 2009 announced that does not result in energy gain. Um, ironically, that announcement was made in July. The determination had actually been made in December of the year before. And there have been some interesting developments in the, in the meantime. And there's about you know, some several hundred people uh, on a forum who are very serious replicators, engineers, scientists, who really think there's something here and had found and had confirmed effects. And so even though there was this negative news, there was a, a positive undertone um, that they still have something. Don't, don't dismiss them quite yet. And then on December 15th, they, they did that demonstration we talked about. And then today. Um, they were supposed to launch their next demonstration. So keep follow our news, and we'll give you a report on what that is all about. They may, it, they, they still have that magnet motor, and, and there's no uh, arguing on a magnet motor. If you have a magnet motor, magnets repelling, attracting magnets, um, sitting on a desk spinning, 
you know, you, you can't say there's any monkey business there. Um, but if you've got a battery involved, and you say, well, you know, the battery could make that thing spin, and, and maybe you're, you're med you need to have the proper input, output, you've got to put an oscilloscope on it, and even that can be tricked. But a, a magnet motor, there's no controversy there. That's, that's my personal favorite is a magnet motor. I would, that would be the perfect open source project um, to get a, a magnet motor that works. And there's been a lot of people that have approached me saying that they've got one or that they've seen one. I've never seen one myself yet in the eight years that I've been covering this. But I'm still a believer that it's possible, probably you know, harnessing some kind of uh, magnetic turbulence that's set up locally by the per perturbation of the magnetic field. Uh, you set up a vortex of some kind. I don't know how it works, but I can't help but think that it could work. I mean, you put a magnet on a fridge, it's not doing any work because it's not moving, but it's sure holding that paper up there really well. Um, you know, that, that's even though it's not work according to the scientific definition of work because work has to be moving something, um, there's energy there. And so there's a lot of inventors who are trying to get that into a rotational force so you can have a motor so they could turn a generator or, or who could be the primary driver in your car going down the road. Um, and they, they have that, that the Storen technology. They, they've got that technology. And there's an electromagnetic variation of it. So it would not necessarily be affordable at first because the, the costs of the, you know, whatnot. I'm not sure on that one um, of how, what kind of cost, because I don't know the output. They're still early in development. There's a lot of research and development and improvement before they're going to get to that point. It would be renewable. Um, not necessarily environmentally friendly. The problem is to, China's got a monopoly on the neodymium market right now. And they're actually starting to uh, pull their muscle a little bit and saying, well, you know, we're, we need the neodymium over here in our market. We're you know, putting up wind turbines and whatnot. And, and they've got like 97% share of the world market on that. And they've cut back their export by 40% in the last year and a half. So that could be a logjam point. Um, so that's one of the considerations in any kind of renewable energy is, is your supply chain. Is it going to work well for you? Um, it would be continuous output. It would be scalable, um, but not as easy as some other technologies. And they've got a really strong team. Boyce hex controller. Uh, Bob Boyce is uh, the next technology. Or number four is actually uh, also by Bob Boyce, a very interesting inventor over in um, the He's over in Oklahoma, I think. Um, this one here, there's a, a guy down in South Africa. That's my daughter right there. It's just a, um, she's modeling what happened here. There's a replicator, a friend of uh, Bob Boyce, who took his circuit. And he was running his circuit off this, his girl's, his daughter's battery from one of these little portable Jeeps or one of these little cars. And the circuit was recharging his, the battery. And so his daughter would play with the car at night. He would plug in his little circuit from Bob Boyce. And in the morning, it would be all charged up. And he did that 35 times. That's free energy, folks. That's pretty cool stuff. And uh, we, we announced that uh, about a month ago. And we formed a discussion group uh, to help uh, get this technology moving forward. Um, the, the, it's being held back right now because Bob Boyce wants to file a provisional on it before he, he gives a green light for the guy who did this uh, replication to tell everyone how he did it. Um, but I, I've been screening the members in this forum as they apply to be on it. There's about 120 people there right now. Really, really sharp guys. And so when that thing, when they get the green light on that, watch out. That's going to be cool. And, and that wouldn't be too hard. I mean, I, I could imagine that being available uh, within six months that you could start you know, getting the schematics and building one for yourself if you have the ability or having a friend do it for you and you know, start powering your kids, uh, recharging your kids' uh, batteries or your laptop batteries or then your car batteries. And that's, that's a cool technology. And it's using a toroid. Nassim Haramine um, has some really interesting uh, concepts on toroids. Uh, and why they work and how they work. There's a lot, some really interesting science on those toroid systems. Um, this next one, um, well, 
notice how many things I have bolded here. Affordable, you know, the whole list except the last two. Practical um, and strong team. They have a pretty good team. I wouldn't consider it to be, you know, that's not, not necessarily their strong point, um, but they, they have a pretty good team of people. And uh, I'm not sure why I didn't bold practical on that one. The second technology is related to this last one. Um, you've heard of these, uh, on the web you can buy these plans, run your car on water, um, and actually all you're doing is you're uh, taking your car's battery and you're running an onboard electrolysis system which separates the hydrogen and the oxygen into a commonly ducted tube. So the hydrogen and oxygen are separated but they go into the same tube, into the air intake, where they catalyze a more efficient burn of the fuel. Somehow you're, you get 30%, 50%. Some people are claiming uh, to even double your mileage with this type of a system. Typically, the improvement's around 30, 15 to 30% improvement in your mileage um, by using that system. Bob Boyce's system, though, um, is, is super efficient. His electrolysis system, the way he pulses the, the um, charge and whatnot, um, there's something called ortho and para, um, of the hydrogen that he's able to measure with uh, NMR that he's got. He's got his own NMR machine, nuclear magnetic resonance, which, you know, they usually a very, they're very expensive, and usually you see them in a, a university laboratory. But he's got one, and he's able to see how, how efficient his system is by the ratios of those two gases. And when he produces his gas, it's like 95%, I think it's ortho. Um, as opposed to the, the typical device is about 65% and the, the equilibrium state is 75%. So the, the normal, the average uh, uh, electrolyzer produces it at 65%. It, it goes up to 75 where it equilibrates. His starts at 95 and then it drops down to 75. And so when it's first made, it's really got a lot of juice. Um, but Another reason I wanted to mention this technology is there's been a lot of, of grief over this technology on the web. Uh, it gets a lot of, of uh, people poo-pooing it, saying bad things about it. You know, there's articles in uh, Scientific American or whatever who basically say this is just junk science. Um, but I tell you, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. And there's a lot of smoke around this one. There's thousands of people around the planet playing with this and getting good results. And there's hundreds of companies that are forming to make these things and sell them to people to install on their cars. So this is a real technology. I'm not talking just about Bob Boyce. I'm talking about the industry of hydroxy, HHO, you know, the, the water for gas type of thing. This, this paradigm we talked about, onboard electrolysis, in, improving your mileage, on the mileage on your car. That's a good technology. Um, but, th but there are some bogus things out there. In fact, Bob Boyce's story is very interesting. Just to give you the tip of the iceberg, Reader's Digest synopsis, when we announced that story about the, uh, the guy that was able to get his child's uh, car to run 35 times in a row, or, or 35 times so far, um, that same story announced the day before we found out that Bob Boyce has terminal cancer. And then the next story was, well, it turns out that the terminal cancer, where that formed, he found a Vera chip in his shoulder. Those little microchips, the RFID chips by Vera chip, um, you know, part of the, what, what, what you want to call it, mark of the beast or whatever, these chips where they usually like track animals, uh, you, you're required to get them when you get them from the pound. He had one in his, in his actually right shoulder, and it was at that point that a, a tumor formed, and when they did the biopsy on it, it metastasized. And his doctor gave him a death sentence and said, we can't do anything about this, you're going to die. Um, so we, of course, told, the, told our community, which is very much into alternative things and had all kinds of suggestions. One guy prayed over him, and he, was at, he had a tumor in his, uh, that had formed in his ankle. He, he said it felt like an ice pick. Um, somebody had taken an ice pick to his ankle, and within like, that same day, he was out of pain and he hadn't been in pain since then because of that one prayer that that guy did. Just really um, a believer type of guy. But, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, trying to, to help him, um, you know, get over this cancer thing because it's still a death sentence um, in terms of that's what the doctor's saying. 
Then he found a second chip in his shoulder, the same shoulder, same place, a little deeper. And this time, when the first one they took it out, the, the doctor showed it to him. He looked at it, went online to the different chip providers, and he found that um, it, was made, it was a bear chip one. It's got the little white on the one end. It's about the size of a grain of rice so that it doesn't migrate in your body. Um, the, the tissue actually grows onto it and locks it in place. And uh, so the second time when he found it again, it was actually the first one, the way he found it, it was broadcasting. He's got all this equipment on his lab, one of which uh, measures radio frequencies, and something was broadcasting. He, his toroid was turned off. He's like, what's going on here? And he, I, he located it in his shoulder. There's something broadcasting from his shoulder. When, so when he had the tumor turned out, taken out, he wanted to see what that was. Um, well, he found it again, a second chip. Apparently, there were two put in at the same time. And this time, he, um, he had an RFID reader. And they got the number off of it, and the number was not listed. So it's either government issued, because they're not on the general database, or it was somebody who can mess with the database so that it doesn't show up anymore. He went to, the do to his doctor and said, look, here's the FR RFID reader. Here's the evidence. Uh, what can we do? And the, uh, the doctor ordered two x-rays, and we published those on our website. They, they showed up in an x-ray. So there's the evidence. Because the first time when they did the biopsy, the, um, they came back from the lab saying they didn't say anything about the chip. So you know, where's your evidence? The second time, now he's got two x-rays that show it. Um, so anyway, so it's, a, it's a very interesting story to do with Bob Boyce. Um, there's more, you can read it on our website. <laughs> um, this electrolyzer technology, um, it would not, it's not continuous output because you've got to power the circuit to make it go. Um, robust and low maintenance, there's, there's some problems with it in terms of, one of the big problems is just maintaining the system. You've got to keep filling up the water tank, and so it's not strong there. Got some other good strengths, though. The Gate Plasma Reactor by Paul Pantone. Um, this is a really interesting technology that is, um, what you have here is um, you've got the exhaust coming from your car going out the exhaust. And what they do is they run that exhaust in one direction. The incoming fuel is going in the other direction. And then you've got a rod in between. And that rod can be made of glass or um, or metal, um, and it, it becomes magnetized. So the one side, it, I, I don't know which side is north, which side is south. Um, and as the incoming fuel goes along that rod, in the opposite, with, with the, ex, the fuels going on, the, uh, it, it's in a separate tube, like a heat exchanger, so they're not mixing. Um, but as those two substances are going in opposite direction, by the time the fuel gets to the end of the rod, and the rod needs to be a specific length, depending on what kind of fuel you have. Um, but, but by the time it gets to the end of the rod, it turns into plasma. Now, what plasma is, is a fourth state of matter. And let's, let's go to another technology to talk about plasma. This is a very mainstream technology, plasma arc technology. They use it in waste to energy, where you take municipal solid waste on the input side, you hit it with a high electrical charge, and whatever molecules you have break down into their elemental form. So if you have H2O, it comes out as O and H. If you have you know, some other carbon molecule, it all breaks down. You have the carbons coming out. You have a, a liquid coming out in your metals, for example. And, and your, uh, what comes out is like a syngas that can be burned. And they'll burn the syngas and make electricity and whatnot. So this is used in um, some of the waste to energy technologies, the plasma arc technology. But it's very high. Um, temperature, um, and it takes a lot of electricity. But in the GEET reactor, the plasma formation is relatively low temperature and low pressure. So it's, somehow they're able to get a plasma. So what that means is that the input fuel can be just about anything. It can be waste oil. It can be pickle juice. It can be Windex. It can be pee. You know, whatever you want to put in the front end, what comes out is syngas. And the syngas, also there's, there may be some electrical things going on. 
Because when they run that into the engine, it doesn't explode, it implodes. You actually have to adjust the timing on your car because you're sucking the, the piston up rather than pushing it down. Um, and what are they doing to the mileage? We're talking three, five, some people reporting eight times the improvement on their mileage by putting a GEAT system in the car. And when he, Paul Pantone was incarcerated in Utah, an hour away from where we were living at the time, at the, the, they call it uh, the state mental institution in Provo, Utah, um, because he was saying he could run a car on water. And they told him that as long as you're saying that, you're not going to get your meds for your pain relief. You're not going to get your medical care for your broken foot. We're not going to do anything for your teeth. His teeth fell out in, in, while he was there. He was there for three and a half years. Um, he, they didn't even tell his son that he was there. His son was trying to find him. says, no, he's not here. Um, when his situation was found out, his son finally found him, started publishing, started doing interviews with his dad, started putting these on YouTube. And a, a legislator in Utah got wind of this and said, this couldn't be happening in Utah. And a few days later, Paul was out of prison. He's now in Oklahoma, and he's teaching classes. And, and you listen to him on, on these shows when he was in the, the mental hospital. He doesn't sound like a mental patient. Very cogent, completely clear, you know, as clear as you or I talking. Very, um, you know, this, 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 this is, he, he does tend to be a big talker. He does tend to exaggerate. But he, man, is he fun to listen to. And, and he teaches these classes, week-long courses. P PhDs come for an intense week-long class to learn how to do this technology, how to optimize it. You can buy, when, when he got out of prison, or out of the, the state mental hospital, he actually um, posted his plans for free on his website with a license to make one unit. So you can go and you can download the plans, you can make one for yourself, you can make one for a friend. If you want to do more than that, you know, talk to us, license it, he says. Um, but he basically you know, gave the plans away, so to speak. Before that, I think he was selling for like $250 on the Tesla Tech website. Um, he was on Coast to Coast talking about that, Coast to Coast AM, um, when he, the day he open sourced that. Not open source, he, he was giving the plans away for free, one license to build one. Um, really interesting guy and technology. Um, affordable, environmentally friendly, load following, portable, strong team. I give them a weak point there because there's been some problems with just developing a, a coherent, a, a team that, that is really robust. Um, but that could change, you know, get some really good people around him that aren't going to try and, and steal the technology who can work with him, not against him, or separate from him. Massive yet tiny engine, Rafael Mergado, a good friend. Um, he has this technology. Here's this illustration. Here he's standing next to an engine that his engine replaces. That thing right there. And the, re the reason it's able to do it is because as this thing goes around one time, there's like 21 cycles going around there where these little clappers go back and forth with the input, output. And so you have massive displacement in a little tiny area. And he had, uh, for quite a while, uh, well, he still has a, an air compressor powered unit. But before that, he had a diesel power unit um, that was running on diesel uh, fuel. And imagine what this would do. You would be able to have a jet pack. Because the problem right now with these jet packs for going airborne, you can go two or three minutes, and that's it. because. The, the weight of the engine, the weight of the fuel, keeps you from going up very long, very, very, um, very high or very long. This technology could be airborne for an hour. And so it would make jet packs and, and human flight possible. It makes a vertical takeoff and land um, a vehicle possible. Um, it, it enables you to have uh, you know, a lot of your weight in your car is the engine, and, and starting and stopping that engine takes a lot of fuel. If you've got a, uh, your engine is now the size of your alternator, a little bigger than your alternator. Um, and so you can have all kinds of, of great technologies come out of this. And uh, he got angel investors this last uh, summer, um, and he's going to be doing a demonstration to the Society of Automotive Engineers 
Um, he was going to do it on May 22nd, and I told my wife, she says, that, you know, that's our anniversary. That's not going to work. And he wanted us to do the webcast of it. So we, he moved it to the 15th so that we, we could go and do the broadcast, and I wouldn't be making my wife mad. Um, so, yay! <laughs> um, but that's a really cool technology. And again, here we have an eccentric inventor um, who has all kinds of ideas how, how he's going to make the world a better place. He's going to save all these jobs in Detroit. And, you know, and when investors come along, they just shake their heads and go, and this, you know, that's not the language. They don't know that language. They don't know the language of help humankind. They know the language of make money and do it fast and get a quick return on investment and, and do things in a practical way. And so, you know, he's had a hard time finding the right kind of money people, but he has found some. And by the time of that demonstration on uh, May 15th, he's going to have, uh, he plans to have a 5.5 inch diameter motor that can power an unmanned aerial vehicle, could power an ultralight, could power a small car. And he hopes to have a demonstration of several of those in those uh, to show um, at a, possibly a demonstration simultaneous or, or, or close to that Society of Automotive Engineers um, presentation. And the reason I have this one on the exotics list, even though you might think it belongs more in the mainstream, because mainstream has not given him the time of day. I mean, he, they, they paid him a little bit of attention, but because, you know, he's running it on air and, you know, there's, it, it's just the, the, too much of an exotic personality. You know, if, if he's my friend, you know he's exotic, and I should tell you that you think this is cool? He's got stuff that is like 10 times cooler than this and that he's told me about, that he's done with this technology. He's actually run stuff on this kind of, I mean, this, some of the things he's told me is amazing. So this is the guy to watch and help if you have the ability. Um, Magna Coaster, another eccentric inventor. He, he was on, um, what was it? Um, there was some kind of a Canadian a show. It's kind of a reality series. And he goes in there wearing a t-shirt that says something like, uh, you know, make physicists mad or something like that. Um, you know, here is supposed to be a professional presentation. And it, it was just really funny, this whole eccentric thing. But one of the guys there took him serious and has given some funding. And he's got this technology, an over-unity system, where you're getting, oops, wrong button. Um, somehow he's able to get more energy out than what he puts in. And he has been, he was hoping to have these things in production last February. There's been just one little thing, well, I've got to do this, got to fix that. Um, the, the capacitor is too big, we've got to get a smaller uh, capacitor. And just one thing after another, that's, that's the case whenever you're rolling something out. But, this guy is taking orders and, and uh, plans to fulfill those orders, and it looks like it's a legitimate technology. Again, on all of these, you know, these are high-risk things because you know, even if the technology might be real, the inventor might be hard to work with, and that makes a high risk. The, the, you know, if you invest time and money with this thing, you might not get anything for it because he might end up deciding he's going to build this thing instead, and then he's going to build this thing, and then you can't get him focused. You know, it, it's hard to work with some of these people. Um, this one would be portable, um, continuous output, environmentally friendly, not load following. Um, Plasmerg, uh, another good friend, John Rohner. Um, he has a technology that, this is cool. A noble gas is, you know, the periodic chart. You've got the gases over here that don't react with anything because they, they're happy with it. They have all the electrons that they want. They don't need any more, don't need any less. They're inert. They don't react. And they take these inert gases and they go into a plasma state and out of a plasma state, into a plasma state, out of a plasma state, in an internal combustion engine without any fuel coming in. Except somehow the amount of fuel involved, they're able to get like one or two atoms that react each cycle. So it's basically a nuclear reaction using these inert gases. And, and that causes the piston to go up and down. Invented by Joseph Papp about 20 years ago, who's deceased. And there's about four or five teams that are 
neck and neck in taking this technology forward, and they're fighting with each other, and it's really ugly. Um, brothers against brothers, Bob Rohner versus John Rohner, they, they hate each other's guts, and, and they, they want to destroy the other team, and it, it's, it's really sad, but the technology's awesome. Um, and <clears throat> we're talking uh, $13 of fuel would, would run your car for a year. Um, so basically, you're buying the engine, which, was, it, which is one-third the cost of an, a typical engine. Okay? So your engine is, is cheaper than a typical engine. It doesn't require any fuel, essentially. That's the PAP engine. And so bet on a horse and, and get involved in the race. <laughs> um, I'm betting on this one. Uh, John Rohn, right? They, they seem to be really good. But they're, you know, I, may the best man win, and, and uh, maybe they stop fighting. That would be what I, I would like to see. Um, again, affordable, uh, not load following, would be continuous output. This thing would just run and run and run. You could run a generator um, with it. Um, Cyril effect. Uh, most of you in here have probably heard of this one before, John Searle. This is a guy who is an energizer man. Um, when you talk about his technologies, like two people, two different lifetimes. This guy had his heyday about 20, 30 years ago. He was flying craft around the planet from the, what, what we can understand. He had anti-gravity craft. In fact, the UFOs that you see flying around are probably hijacked from him. It's probably pirated technology by the US government and other governments that they got from John Searle. They put him in prison because he was making more electricity than he should have in his home. So they got him on that. He was powering his own home. They said, you're stealing it. No, I'm not. I'm making it. No, you're stealing it. So they put him in jail. And uh, they planned on just, you know, he was just going to disappear. But he, got, he came out of jail. And he's getting a team back together. And he's just about replicated this stuff. Um, this has been over the last uh, decade or so. And so subscribe to this website where you can get access to the back end, see their latest work. I mean, they've got, they've got some great replicators, some great um, uh, engineers involved in this technology. Um, not only does it generate electricity, but it has counter-gravity effects. And so you could fly to the moon in an afternoon as opposed to uh, several days, and you can do it for the price of a, of a ticket to Tokyo. Um, you know, that's the kind of technology we're talking about here. So the reason I don't have him as number one is just because, you know, he, he's 85 years old. And he still seems to be really clear and, and uh, clever and with it. But you know what happens at that age. And the technology is not fully replicated yet. So there's a high risk factor there. Will we be able to get it replicated before he leaves us? Um, there's some really sharp people working on it. So this would be a good horse to help out uh, in this race. Um, load following, if I understand right, it gives you what you need when you need it. Um, and it, you know, you could put it when you're in your house. You could basically have a mobile home. <laughs> Go wherever you want. That would be cool. Um, jet thermal products, cold fusion technology. This is a professor at MIT, um, Schwartz, or yeah, Michael Schwartz. Um, did an interview with him about two years ago. He did a demonstration at MIT. They had a conference. At, no, getting two stories mixed up. He did a, yeah, it was at a conference. And for, I think, three days continuous, he was showing more energy out than what he was putting in in a cold fusion reactor. Cold fusion is a real technology. It got a bum rap at the very beginning because it was, it's kind of like kids playing in the gun closet. Something works, but we don't know how. You pull this trigger, and something happens, but we're not sure. You pull the trigger again, well, if there's no shell in the chamber, it's not going to go off. And so, they were having problems with repeatability at the very first, because even now, it's an evasive technology. They don't fully understand it. There are two or three international conferences every year on cold fusion, people that are replicating the effect, describing it. Even the US National Laboratories have published um, papers in the last year validating cold fusion as a real technology. Um, here's some headlines from last year. Um, 
nuclear engineering says cold fusion, a possible source of power. There's compelling new scientific evidence that the existence of low energy nuclear reactions, according to a group of scientists. Here's one in American Free Press, Newsweek, Scientific America, EE Times, uh, IEEE Spectrum, which is one of the most respected uh, engineering uh, magazines. All we're talking about, you know, cold fusion is a real phenomenon and has, been, and has been proven to be something worth looking at. And yet, to talk to the man on the street or the average newspaper, it still gets, raises the eyebrow, cold fusion is bunk science. It's not, it's not junk science. It is real. And this group, um, Eric Schwartz group, uh, is probably going to be the first one to come up with a commercial device that you can buy, put in your home, power your car, or whatever. And they're probably three to five years away from having something. That's just a guess. I don't, I'm not really close to that one. Um, not load following, but continuous output. I don't know if it's, it's going to be a while before that one's affordable because it, it's not a really strong output. Um, they're just barely getting over Unity right now. Uh, but in 10 years, you know, follow, it's like the computer industry. It might be expensive now, but just wait a few years. The price will come down, the things will get smaller. That's what's going to happen in renewable energy as well. Um, that's our destiny. And it, it's already happening with solar wind and geothermal. The prices are coming down becoming more um, practical as new, new technologies come forward. When this exotic stuff comes forth, man, all bets are off. That, that's when the oil interest, that's when they lose their seat in the synagogue, so to speak. That's when, they, that's when they come out of power, and that's when the earth transformation comes forward. You can see why these technologies are going to be an important part of the transformation that we're going through with this whole 2012 thing or whatever you want to call it as we go into the age of Aquarius, whatever you want to call it, we are in transformation. And free energy technology is going to play an important role. So that's number 10. Here's our sponsor. I have him as number 13 on this list. And I include him in the exotics because uh, he's had a hard time getting uh, the interest and attention and recognition from the mainstream press. They, all they've done is rake him through the coals. Um, there are some controversies involved with the, uh, the CEO of the company. There's some negative press out there. He has good answers for some of it, and maybe some of it he deserves. But nobody's perfect, and uh, you, you get exotic personalities in leaderships of companies, but they still have something great. Um, this technology, they have a 100 ton per day production plant in Pasco, Washington that works. I've been there twice. Um, this facility here, and they're uh, going around the planet. Most of their deals are coming overseas, um, but uh, this would convert conventional municipal solid waste. You separate out the glass, get rid of the stone, because that's just not going to do anything. Get rid of the metals. You can use magnets to pull those out. So two-thirds of your feedstock coming from the municipal solid waste, you break it into smaller pieces, run it into an auger, they have a, a proprietary process, a, a ca catalyst, which they call a nanotechnology. And I'm not, not sure if it actually qualifies as nano. But um, this, this catalyst, which basically takes a million year process and converts it into a few minutes. Okay, So you take this stuff, and it turns into high grade fuel. It goes into these columns right here, where it's separated out. You have the naphthas, you have the um, the diesels, you have your, um, you know, you separate out your fuels here, your gasolines, you get some uh, methane off the top, and you can run your electrical generators. They make about two and a half megawatts in, with that plant, um, one of which they need to run the plant, one and a half of which they can sell as, you know, to the grid or whatever. Um, and then, again, the fuel coming off of this is supposed to be um, high quality, better than what you can get from fossil fuels. Um, and so this technology is, is available now. Um, so if you have a few million dollars and you want to buy one for your city, go talk to Michael Spitzauer. Okay? And again, he's, he's the one that sponsored my wife coming on this trip today. Um, um, not a, I, I, you know, I'm not italicizing affordable because you will actually um, make money with this plant. 
Um, but it's not going to be as, as good as some of these other renewables that we've talked about, some of these um, free energy technologies. And the reason I included in a free energy category is because waste is a free energy source. As long as there are humans, there's going to be waste. And um, we've got some piles of trash out in the ocean. It's going to take a while to get rid of. And we can even go to some of our landfills and re reclaim some of that. So it's going to be a long time before we run out of waste to power these plants. And so that's a free energy source. I, I like to consider that as the free energy technology. Continuous output. Um, and italicized load following because it's, anyway, we don't need to get into all the uh, minutiae there. Um, here's a quick list of some of the runners up. Um, black light power is one of the favorites of people saying, why, why don't you include black light power? And, probably just because I don't understand it well enough to talk about it. Um, it's, it's really cool technology involving a new state of, uh, of hydrogen. Um, and it, it's, uh, they've been published. Um, the, the mainstream press publishes, and may, maybe that's why I'm not as interested in them, because they get um, some attention there. Um, I like to really focus and emphasize technologies that don't get the due attention that they deserve. Um, Here's one that I just barely found out about. I'm going to look into this pyramidal power. Pyramidal power. Um, thorium based is really interesting technology. Beta voltaics, where you can use, uh, in fact, those exit signs you see in, the, in here, th that's a beta voltaic technology. The, the batteries in those are actually from a decaying uh, isotope. And you're able to, you know, if, if they get that battery, um, more practically, you could actually power a cell phone with it, so you'd never have to recharge a cell phone. And that kind of technology is two to five years away, um, called beta voltaics. Um, Ken Round is a member of our New Energy Congress. He's got a heat engine. Uh, I, I would have probably included that one, except I don't understand it well enough to talk about it. Same with Nelson Scientific. They don't like getting attention. Um, Focus fusion, we talked about that one earlier. Um, Timothy Thrapp of World Changing Technologies has some really good stuff. Um, let's go into a few of these. We've got a few minutes. Um, here is, OK, this one I just decided to throw in. It's not on our website yet, and you have not heard about this one yet. Um, this one will be announced probably in February. This is a, I can't give the name of the company, can't give you specifics. I'm under NDA with um, some of the things on this. But these guys can take municipal solid waste and convert it into building materials that are super strong, inert. Um, they don't have any, uh, you know, they get, get rid of all of the um, bacteria, whatever that might be in there. Um, and you can make a, a wall, for example, two inches of this stuff is as strong as seven inches of plate steel. It's cheaper and it's lighter. So of course, the military is interested in it. And when they announce, they'll probably have President Obama come and announce it. They're building 20 plants right now. The first two will go online probably in February. And they want to address the huge pile of trash out in the ocean that's larger than the size of Texas. As these plastics go out into the ocean, they, there's this big uh, current. It's like a big eddy current in the ocean that really gradually spins. The reason the, the, the liners don't see it, the ocean liners, um, is because they don't travel through it. They, they go around where the currents carry them. They, it's like you know, jet following the, the jet stream. So they go around the periphery, but in the middle of where this big pile of trash, where, where, where the ocean spins around, it, it collects all the junk. And you wouldn't believe the rate at which that pile increases on a daily basis. And these guys could take that and turn it into building materials and get rid of that pile in about 150 years. So this is one you want to keep an eye on. Of course, they're not going to have any hard time getting press when they go public with it. Um, and it really doesn't qualify as a, an exotic technology. It uses some fairly mainstream. But I wanted to throw that out because you here in Hawaii, are, I'm sure, have a special interest in it because this island is a lot bigger than yours and, uh, and it's not as pretty. Um, and I don't see anyone going there on vacations. Um, 
And, and I'm sure you'd love to see that go away. <clears throat> Number 11 in our top, uh, in the short list, Kapanazzi. Um, these guys, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do since we're uh, running up to the end of the time, I want to talk about open sourcing for a second. I'm just going to flip through these really quick. Um, this is a solid state system. 100, uh, 100 kilowatt um, third party testing video shown on YouTube. Um, they had problems with one of the people they were uh, talking with, one of the business partners, and so that one may, it's going to be in dicey waters for a while. Here's this Timothy Thrapp's technology. Again, we can get this PowerPoint from off our website, um, spend some time at PezWiki.com. These guys are going to be coming forward. I have confidence in them. Magnetic Power Inc. in Sebastopol, California. Um, solid state systems for powering stuff. Blacklight Power, we talked about them. Remgen is one that they don't want me talking about them right now. People are wondering why I still talk about Perendev. This one's very controversial. It's made a lot of promises, taken a lot of money, and uh, it's slow in delivering product. Um, I actually traveled to Johannesburg to see this one when I first got involved in this stuff, kind of what got me launched. Um, Mike Brady's a neat guy. Um, I, I wish he would have um, other people running his company um, because he's one of those people who thinks that because he's smart in vending, he can also be smart running a company. Um, but I wish them the best. He's got a 300 kilowatt, 300 kilowatt, that's about 100 times what you need to run a house generator, supposedly electromagnetic system um, that would be fairly affordable, that would be continuous output um, using the magnetic motor technology he started out with. <clears throat> uh, really quick, maybe one of you in here has a technology up your sleeve your, uh, that you want to get moving forward. Um, it is outside the box. You know, let us know about it if you feel comfortable, and we can, um, if you don't want it published on the web, we can get some of our network involved um, on, the, on the quiet, or if you want um, to open source it, you know, that's what we started our company to do, um, is to help people uh, put it out. We'll talk about open sourcing as right now. Um, the ideal, see, see these technologies, what happens is there's so many roadblocks, so many things that you have to do to take something from prototype stage to bring it into market. There's, it's just an overwhelming process, even for normal technologies. And when you start adding the exotic component to it, um, it's just, I, I, I like to use the, the sperm and egg analogy. It was, um, you know, once, it, it's not just one sperm that fertilizes the egg. There's tons of sperm that have tried, and they break down the barrier around the, the perimeter of the egg until finally one's able to get in, and then once, once one gets in, then the thing's fertilized and the process goes on. Um, all of these technologies that have tried to make it to market, um, I can't help but think that they help break down you know, the, the mental barriers that we have to free energy, and eventually one of these is going to get the attention of the planet, and then it's going to be downhill from there. It's going to be easy sailing. Um, and I, I can't help but think that that's going to, that, that we're, the head's emerging from the birthing canal in the analogy of childbirth, um, that this baby's about to be born. Could be this year. Uh, I would hope it'd be this month. Um, it could be tomorrow. We've got a, a guy with a magnet motor technology that is super simple, and if, if that thing really works, uh, that's just what we've been looking for. Um, the ideal open source project, it works, it's been validated, um, it's easy to replicate, it's inexpensive, it's not encumbered by IP, you don't have some patent somewhere that's going to tie people up, and it's sexy, you know, people, you know, it gets people's imagination going. Um, when, when we find one of those, the world will be a different place, because now not only can you build something that works, but it's actually, you know, going to start people will just go crazy over this, doing all the different applications, doing all the different sizes and shapes, and, and if you change this out for that, then you get twice the power output. Um, I found in Australia, if you use, we, we get this part, um, replace this part for that one. Uh, over in Austria, we use, you know, the, it, the open source is the way to go with this stuff, just 
to accelerate the development, to accelerate the expansion. And if you had a, a technology that you could actually power a house with and you open source it, it's not going to take 50 years to reach market penetration like the television. It could take maybe two or three years. And everyone could build one, on, uh, build one of their own. And, and the, the world doesn't have to go into meltdown because we've got the hope that we've got a way to dig ourselves out. We, we're not dependent on the power grid anymore. We can build our own power devices. Just imagine the hope that that would give people. So, man, I hope something like this comes forward soon. Um, I want to mention a book, Breakthrough Power, by Gene Manning and Joel Garvin, associates of mine in the New Energy Congress. Um, it's on the back, the shelf back there, um, on our table, and it's uh, about 20 bucks. And it, 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 what it does is it, it, it's a presentation of these kinds of breakthrough um, technologies. There's not a lot of overlap in what's in their book with what we talked about in today's presentation, but the general idea is the same. Here are technologies that have working prototypes that have, here's the story behind them, and for some reason or another, they haven't made it to market yet. Um, and, and to basically get your imagination going on what's available out there and, and get you excited about what the possibilities are. Even if you're, when I read the book, you know, here I am, Mr. Free Energy, Free Energy News, and I found myself getting all kinds of uh, new information about what's out there, what's available, what, what the possibilities are. So I highly recommend this book as the book to get yourself and others excited about the free energy possibilities and motivated to go to the politicians and help break the log jams down, all the different obstacles that stand in the way of these technologies moving forward. <clears throat> The law of attraction, you build it, they will come. They will come. Um, we've got a website, Free Energy News. People send me cool stories. I post them. It, it, it helps perpetuate the cycle of creativity and ingenuity. It's a fun process. I'd um, like to invite you to subscribe to our freeenergynews.com newsletter and visit us every day or every week, whatever your level of interest is. Um, I think you'll find all those stories interesting that we've, you know, we, we do them in a really tight bullet format, uh, title, description, little picture to go along with it, and it'll take you a few seconds each day just to see what's going on. Maybe something will capture your interest, forward it on to a friend, help us propagate the message of free energy. I want to thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. Here are some of the websites that you can go to to get more information. Our PezWiki.com website is our, the Wikipedia of free energy. It is publicly editable, so you can go in and you can make the changes, correct the spelling error, uh, add something that you, if you want, if you know of a technology, you can create a feature page. We'll link to it in our news. Help you clean it up, maybe do some editing. If you, you see something, needs, you know, some error, you can fix it. FreeEnergyNews.com used to be a separate website, now forwards to PezWiki. We have the, our news page there now. Um, PESN.com is uh, some stories that we publish, um, several, two or three a week. Um, then New Energy Congress. And then here's my email address, phone number, sterlingda at, pure, Sterling DA at pureenergysystems.com. Um, and we're out of time, so I won't take your questions unless you want to talk to me afterwards. And again, we do have books back there. Um, I'm not going to be sitting back there very often, but I'm going to leave the books out there. If you want a book, take it. I've got some instructions back there of how you can get the money to me, whether it's through a PayPal account or send me a check or send, send uh, Gene Manning a check. Um, you know, there's, I'll, I'll trust you, and uh, I didn't get her permission to do this, but um, I, I trust you guys. This is a good audience. Um, and so I hope that we don't have to take any books home. There's 20 over there. And there's a lot of you in here, so hopefully uh, there will be at least 20 of you who get one of those. And if, you, if they run out, you can always get them online. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And once again, to make a donation to Sterling, go to his website. Thank you.